It's around the middle of July 2020, and whilst we've both been able to keep busy in the shed here, we have, for the last however many months, been totally devoid of any kind of motorsport-related fun. We're by no means alone in this, and during the period of inactivity, a lot of people have turned to sim racing to exorcise their competitive demons. Given its rapid rise in profile and the complete lack of any alternative, we of course intended to join them. And then we had a look at what sort of kit we needed to get started. Back in the late 90s, we invested in a PlayStation 1 and a number of driving games including Gran Turismo and Colin McRae Rally. Friends would come over to drink beer and challenge us, but some made excuses about their skill with a controller. So we built what must have been one of the first driving sims using an old bucket seat donated by Nick's Uncle Phil, various bits of galvanised steel tubing and the first steering wheel and pedal set. It was fully adjustable, so even our shortest friends had no excuses. Today you can pick up a wheel and a pedal set for a few hundred quid, and assuming you have the software and a PC powerful enough to run it, you can get going for reasonable money. However, to be competitive, you need to spend a lot more. These second-hand rigs aren't even the most expensive we could find, and this one is more than £17,000. The peripherals for sim racing can be more than the real thing. This sim racing pedal box, for example, is 1,200 quid, and this steering wheel is nearly 1,500. Things have definitely moved on a lot since we started with those early racing games, and nowadays the realism, the mechanics and the software is just otherworldly. But while sim racing is real fun, and it is real racing, what it isn't is real motorsport. It was this opinion that triggered many discussions amongst our group of friends. The upshot of which is that we're convinced you can have a real motorsport experience for less than the cost of a simulated motorsport experience. It sounds improbable, but actually all you need is a bona fide race car that won't break the bank. This is not that. What it is, is a 2005 Citroen C1 in full POV-spec Vibe trim level. What that means is wind-up windows, no central locking, no aircon, no alloy wheels and no redeeming features of any kind. But it does have just 85,000 miles on the clock and a quarter a tank of fuel. If this is not already screaming thoroughbred race car at you, what we've got under here <laughs> is the now legendary in tuning circles Toyota 1K RFE. Don't be fooled, despite its sub one litre capacity and only three cylinders, what this is, is 68 horsepower of fury. Of course it wasn't just the overwhelming lack of horsepower that attracted us to this particular car. You may have noticed, and I'm pleased to confirm, that there isn't a single straight panel on the car. But those are features, not faults. Fans of touring cars especially will recognise that all these dings and scrapes are just hallmarks of a serious tin top racer. And these have come pre-installed. So how much did we pay for all of this competition heritage? Well, just £850 on the road. But to what end? Well, in an act of serendipitous timing, the British Racing and Sports Car Club, or BRSCC, recently launched their new series, the City Car Cup. Open to the Toyota Igo, the Peugeot 107 or our Citroen C1, they're basically all the same car built in the same factory, this new series promises really close racing for entry-level money, thanks to a set of well-thought-out and tightly controlled regulations. Within those regulations, to keep costs down and to keep the racing closer than current social distancing protocols allow, the organisers have come up with a kit of mandatory parts. The kit must be bought from City Car Cup and it must be fitted in its entirety to every vehicle racing. There's quite a lot of parts here, and we'll explain about each of them as we get to fitting them. So we've got the vehicle, and we've got the kit, it's time to turn this thing into a race car. The trickiest part of which is probably going to be fitting the roll cage, so we'll start by removing the ECU. The Daihatsu designed Toyota engine in our Citroen went through many different tunes over the years to comply with differing legislation, and of course it was fitted to many different models. To avoid the possibility of one ECU tune, from one specific model and time being slightly more powerful than the others, and therefore giving the driver an advantage, the organisers have chosen to standardise the ECU map for all competitors. This means whipping it off and sending it away to be flashed with the requisite tune, sealed and then sent back. So given that it takes about a week or so, and the race is in two weeks, we figured that should come first. Yeah. 
the ECU will be safely packed up and dispatched, now we can turn our attention to pulling out the interior. Apart from the fact that it was cheap, it had 6 months MOT left on it and at 85,000 miles was just about run in. The main reason we chose this particular car is that the C1 in Vibe trim level was the lightest of all the eligible cars. Now, you're allowed to move the air conditioning and associated gubbins but find one without it and that's one less job to do. The bulky parts of the interior come out first. As with all cars, disassembly is the reverse of assembly but Given that we don't really know the exact order that everything went in, some educated guesses as to how it all got put together speed us on our way. Right, so that's the seats out and now the car can be put on axle stands and then we can rip out the rest of the insides. AF. Not sure if he was referring to my disassembly skills or the gluing in of the headlining. Anyway, here I am struggling with the window winder handle. Because, you know, having a just a f screw hold it on would be far too simple. Yep, instead you've got to try and fish that gold clip out with a pick wedged between the handle and the door card. Thanks. Three screws secure the door card to the door around the handle area. These are the only proper fasteners. The rest is attached by trim clips. The airbags have to be removed. And also, 
we are not going to be using the OEM steering wheel, so this whole assembly has got to go. The steering wheel is on a tapered spline and can need some persuasion to get off. Gorilla! Under this flap hide the passenger side airbag fixing and connector. There's no need for banging tunes in a race car so the weedy speakers get removed and trashed. Which then reveals one of the screws that hold the dash top down. The instrument cowlings need to be removed carefully as they'll be going back on later. The one screw that holds the radio and switch panel in is hidden underneath the fan speed knob. Then the whole thing sort of pulls out with the addition of some brute force and ignorance. Thus. So disconnect the radio and disconnect the switches and the whole panel can get put aside for a little modification later. It also reveals the final two screws that hold the dash down. Anything else? No, that's it. You got it? The final part of the interior disassembly is to remove the passenger airbag from the dash top. We'll need to put the dash back in after the cage is installed. And that's it. We're now ready to start putting stuff back in. For a fairly modern car, that disassembly was surprisingly easy. Anyway, now that I've done the important stuff, it's over to Nick to fit the cage. The roll cage is a six point bolt-in type made from 45 mil diameter, two and a half mil wall thickness CDS tube. It has double diagonals in the rear, along with harness bars and a beefy looking pair of door bars to boot. It's certainly very sturdy and should provide excellent protection if I somehow tip it over. So fit the cage, step one, just a case of welding these laser cut and pre-bent reinforcement plates into the car. Pre-made and supplied captive nuts to be welded into the respective holes. And I'm still not sure how I feel about that. Before we can do any welding of plates or nuts, we've got to wrestle the cage into the car. And given that it's in six sections, you'd think that would be easy, wouldn't you? The front legs foul on the end of the dash and while trying to remove the handy map pocket it became clear how it was all made. Oh this is all one part, this is a hinge. That's all one bit. Not for long. A very sharp knife would probably have done the trick but that would have meant leaving the grinder on the scarecrow and we can't be having that now can we? The bit that's really in the way gets the treatment too, Natch. I think some, some tidying required. No. Anyway. And we retain the clip on the top for the dash. 
Nick needs no excuse to whip out the finger sander, and the unsightly plastic burrs put up little resistance to the 60 grit zirconia abrasive. Of course we needed to do the same on t'other side before we can crack on with the assembly of the cage. That was just the first of a number of times the cage needs to go in and out, but before all that malarkey, with it now in the right position, the foot mounting plates can get placed and their location marked. You had a parallax over on your pen. The captive nuts sit underneath the mounting plate, so we need to add some holes in the body shell for those nuts to sit into. After drilling the clearance holes, the area destined to be welded to has all the original paint removed. As you can see, the factory didn't go too heavy with the sprayer here. I mean, why waste money painting something properly that you're never likely to see? Of course, we don't want our little citron dissolving away prematurely, so some weld through primer is added to make sure that doesn't happen. And now all six mounting plate positions are sorted. So the shell is ready, but the plates need their nuts. He may have been sceptical at first about a third party supplying his captives, but it soon became apparent that it was one less job to do, and the quality of the parts is excellent. So I told him to stop sulking and get welding. And then he told me to get stuffed and get the kettle on, which was hard to argue with in fairness. A lick of primer puts the finishing touch to the mounting plates. The next step is to bolt the cage to the plates and then tack the plates to the shell. Only this leg of the main hoop, now that the other side is fixed, is somewhat short of where it needs to be to get the bolts in. And even our 187 pound gorilla can't get it to line up. Need something with more waft. It's not unusual for the cage legs to do this. Even though they're all welded up in a jig, a tiny distortion at the top, maybe where the diagonals meet the main hoop, gets amplified at the bottom where the legs attach to the car. A porter power is a handy tool to have around for situations such as this. All the mounting plates are bolted to the cage and they're ready to be tacked in. The tricky front leg position requires Nick to pull some contortions to access, but that's now all the mounts secured and the cage can come out again before welding them all in fully. We join Nick halfway through the first plate. The reason he's spotting these welds so much is that the plates are three mil thick and the body shell isn't. So what you don't want to do is blow a hole in your chassis when you're welding these in because that would be bad. Anyway. The other five feet were done in exactly the same way, but it's boring and we don't want to set off anyone's photosensitivity. So we'll move on. The final job before the cage can go back in for good is to fill these gaps between the main hoop plates and the sill with these little fillets that come with the kit. There, sorted. All that bare steel needs protecting and the acid etch primer comes off the bench to complete this task. We had a can of the quite attractive metallic blue mixed up, 
and that goes over the primer to mimic the patchy paint look of the original. With the paintwork dry, the cage can now go back in for good. And in a sign of some careful and considered fitting, the screws are all finger tight in the holes. But finger tight is no good when it's my neck on the block, so I'm going to tighten them to the point I give myself an aneurysm. <laughs> I think that's got it. We'll leave the door bars for now because you wouldn't believe what a massive pain in the ass they are to work around. But now I've fitted the main cage, we've got a problem with the dashboard, in as much as it doesn't actually fit anymore. The front legs of the cage now take up the space where the back of the vents did originally, so some careful modification with various power tools is necessary to relieve the dash in this area. It depends on the car and the cage, but if you're obliged to run the original dashboard, this is a modification that's almost always required. He may be a lunatic with a grinder fetish, but it's hard to argue with the results. Brilliant. That's now ready to go back in. Well, it would be if we hadn't got hold of one that's been flocked, because nothing says race car like a flocked dash. You may think it's overkill on a small, underpowered French shopping trolley, but if so, you can just flock off. Very easy indeed to remove, but not so simple to get back in. But after some persuasion, the dashboard is in place and ready to be screwed down again. There you go, one anti-glare flocked dash sorted. On to the next job, which is the driver's footrest. This comes with the mandatory kit and therefore must be fitted. Good job, it's quite nice then. And the guys at SW Motorsport had all our parts powder coated in Nick's colour du jour, grey. The bracket on the left picks up on the centre console support bolt, but the right side needs a couple of riv nuts in the inner sill. Must make sure it goes in the level though. Trust the step drill makes short work of the inner sill and then the riv nuts can be installed, not forgetting a little dab of Loctite to give us half a chance of them staying put. Before it's all covered, the mess I've made needs cleaning up and Henry is on hand to suck up the swarf. Finally, the footrest can be screwed into place. And with the three fasteners nipped up tight, that's the footrest done. Let's move on to installing the seat base. The seat base is handily designed to fit directly onto the original seat mounts. So all that's required is to place it in position and tighten the screws. And even I can manage that much. There you are, see? Sorted. Removing the old plastic door cards has made for an unsightly mess inside the cabin. Happily, the kit comes with these ready-made replacements along with the fixings. So it's just a case of banging them on, isn't it? Nope, it's not quite that simple. For the electric window equipped models, this door card is perfect. But our wind-up window handle clip doesn't go through the hole. There, that's much better. This additional hole is for clearance on a bolt that holds the window winder mechanism on. Again, not a problem for cars equipped with electric windows. These were the very first kits made for this series, so one or two small teething problems were expected. It's not as if an extra hole in the door card is a big deal, so we think they've done exceptionally well in the current challenging circumstances. The modifications have been made, the holes in the door have been drilled out to accept our preferred trim clips, and the door card can go on. After the clips comes the door handle, and without the original surrounds, all that's holding it on is this one little screw. 100% being snapped off at some point. It's easy to overlook where the handle is positioned when the window is up. You don't want it fouling the door bars, so before it's clipped on, 
Nick makes sure it won't be in the way. The lock still works, but it doesn't all flap about a lot. Hmm. A slightly remodelled rubber-lined P-clip is used to keep the lock in place and to stop it rattling. I must admit, I like that touch. So that's the door cards installed and very neat they are too. Let's move on to the rain light and bracket. Just like the captive nuts earlier, and much to Nick's chagrin, this bracket comes pre-made, so all we've got to do is bang it on. Although, it takes the place of the rear window wiper motor, so that assembly must come off first. The rain light bracket uses the window latch bolts to fix it in place, so the latch is removed temporarily so we can screw the bracket into position. All these pre-made and easy to install parts are definitely having an effect on Nick's state of mind. I caught him recently sitting in the corner clutching his mug, rocking back and forth, staring into middle distance and muttering something about M10 nuts. But the odd part was he was drinking Earl Grey. A grommet to plug up the wiper armhole finishes the bracket install. While strictly speaking not part of the mandatory kit of parts, it seems crazy not to fit the actual rain light while we're here. So I've dug it out of the safety kit and I've wired it into the heated rear window circuit. We'll relabel the switch on the dash later. A few zip ties keep the wiring neat and tidy and that's another job sorted. So the rain light concludes the interior part of the mandatory kit. Join us next week, that's right I said week, when we'll start on the running gear.